Okay, let me welcome everybody. Let me welcome you to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator, host, and your cat herder for the next hour. I'm very glad to see you all here for our session about teaching the future. Now, to begin with, uh, I'd like to introduce the forum. Let me explain where it comes from, how it works, how it's funded. Then I'll introduce this week's guest and we can dive in. So, to begin with, do you know, the forum is a discussion-based venue. Uh, we are all about conversation. Uh, the handful of slides I'm going to show you right now are going to disappear in just a few minutes. The whole idea is that we'll have conversation using a variety of technologies between multiple people. Now, the forum is a spinoff of the Future Trends and Technology and Education Report. Uh, the FTTE report is a monthly publication, a trends analysis that looks at the major trends reshaping the future of American and global higher education and technology. If you haven't seen it before, just go to FTTE.us. You can download a few sample issues and subscribe if you like. Now, the FTTE report and the uh, Future Trends forum combine to become the Future of Education Observatory. Now, this is a multimedia, ongoing, open conversation about the future of education. And this includes the forum. It includes the FTT report. It also includes a blog. It includes a book club, along with a bookstore, and some other developments coming up early next year. So if you haven't seen that, just go to futureofeducation.us and you can learn more. Now, let me explain before we go further uh, a little bit about how this is funded and who supports it. And we'd like to thank some of our most generous contributors. So to begin with, we're really grateful to NYSERNet in New York State. That's a non-for-profit that helps keep that state's colleges and universities, along with clinics and libraries and museums, on broadband internet. And they do fantastic work innovating the technology and building a collaborative projects. And we're really grateful to them for their support. We're also really grateful to Shindig, because as you can tell, they make available this technology we're using right now. So let me explain. Let me walk you through it so you can see how it works. Where I am right now and where this slide is, just for a moment, this is called the stage. It's called that because it's like a physical stage. Everybody can see and hear what's going on up here. Uh, we can have up to four different people here at a single time. So in just a few minutes, we'll be able to have not just myself and this week's guest, but two of you or more if we like. Now, if you look below us, you know, the first thing you'll see is a whole banner of a bunch of different people. You can see folks like Tom Riley, you can see Sherry Jones, you can see Mark Corbett Wilson. Each of those represents a single person or a few people in a single sign in. Uh, I think of that as a participant swarm. And as you watch, you'll see them move back and forth a little bit. Sometimes they're represented by video feeds, sometimes by pictures, uh, like Myron Williams, sometimes by silhouettes, like Jeff Morgan. Uh, now, if any one of those people strikes you as so fascinating that you want to have a conversation with them, simply double click on their icon. And if they want to talk with you, your two icons will click together like Legos. You can have your own private audio visual bubble, which is pretty neat. But if you want to talk with everybody else, ah, let me show you a few ways. Look at the bottom of the screen. There's a white strip running along it and has a few different buttons. On the leftmost edge, you'll see a number. I think it's 31, along with a little box. Uh, if you click on that, up will pop two different boxes. The leftmost one will give a kind of film strip view of everybody who's here in on this video conference. So you can mouse over and learn a little bit more about each person, which is pretty handy. But to the right of that, you'll see a chat box, and that's going to be a chat for the people who have come into this video conference with you. It's usually about 18 or 20 folks at one time. So you can just have a text chat there. And people do things like, right now we're joking about New Jersey, people are comparing notes on temperature, the people in Arizona are saying that they are very chilly because it's only 64. Uh, the chat box is a good place for informal conversation, a good place to meet people, a good place to exchange ideas. And I find also people share references that come up during our conversations. They, send, they share URLs and other links. So the chat box is one. Let's go back to that white strip again. Next to the chat box button, you'll see a button that has a question mark with a circle around it. And this is a very popular one. If you type that, if you click that button, up will pop a little box into which you can type a comment or a question. And what we do with that is we have a row of those and we store them. And when the time is right, we flash one of them on the screen so everyone can see it. Then I read it out loud so everyone can hear it. So that asking of questions is pretty useful. Now next to that on the white strip, there's a button that's a raised hand. If you click that, that tells us that you want to join us up here on stage. So if you have a microphone and a camera, and if you're in a place where you can speak out loud without getting in trouble, uh, click that button 
And then when the time is right, we can beam you up here on stage and you can join us. I'll show you how to do it. It's really easy. Uh, and you can have your own face-to-face -face conversation with uh, myself and with this week's guest along with other participants. So you can use that video. You can use that question mark for text. You can use the chat box to type in comments. If that's not enough, you can go outside of shit. You can go to Twitter. Just use the hashtag FTTE, and you can put in questions and comments there, and you will see people doing that as well. So this is a space for conversation. You have those three internal channels to use. Please take advantage of them. Don't be shy by asking me questions about how to use them. We're really grateful to Shindig for making this technology available. We're also grateful to our supporters on Patreon. And if you don't know Patreon, it's a crowdfunding site like, Ghost, like uh, GoFundMe or Kickstarter, which lets people collaboratively fund a project they like. In this case, it's our project of making media and facilitating conversations about the future of education. So if you go to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander, you'll see there's more than 100 people who contribute as little as a dollar a month to make sure that we keep the lights on and that we have all the technology working. Uh, so you can see here, actually, from the slide, uh, people like Bob Johnson, Chris Lotmar, Armour, Kyle Johnson, Hugh Blackmar, um, Michael Hoggins, a whole bunch of great people who contribute even more. Please join them if you can. Just go to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander. And we are really, really grateful to our good friends at Patreon for their support. Now, that's how this is supported. That's how the technology works. That's the purpose of the form and where it came from. Let me introduce this week's guest. I am very, very delighted to bring on board Peter Bishop. The reason is not just that he's a brilliant person. Not just that he is one of the leading academic supporters of Futures work, having been the head of this great Futures program at the University of Houston, but also because he's keenly involved in helping people teach the future. Let me explain. For almost three years now, here in the Future Transform, we've been looking at the future of education technology. We've been talking about emerging technologies, emerging practices, programs, applications. We've been looking at major trends that reshape education. But we haven't looked into not just pedagogy, but the pedagogy of teaching the future. How can we help students think more powerfully and effectively about the future? What curriculum needs to be built for that to happen? And that's what Peter Bishop is focusing on. He's created the Teach the Future initiative. In full disclosure, I'm on his board, um, and he does great work. So without any further ado, let me bring Peter up on stage so he can join us, and we can start having a conversation about how you best teach the future. Peter, can you see us and hear us? Everything is working just great, Brian. It's a, it's a pleasure Fantastic. to be with you this, oh, this it's afternoon great. for you guys. Oh, it's great to see you. It's great to see you. Where are you today? Uh, I've moved from Houston, where I practiced uh, futures for more than 40 years at the University of Houston. Mm -hmm. I'm now in Sacramento, California, um, and we moved out here primarily for family reasons. And uh, so we're enjoying uh, California after the uh, after 40 years in Texas. Well, congratulations on your successful move, and um, I'm I'm going to be wimpy enough not to ask you about the temperature there. Um, <laughs> It's not freezing. No, I, I bet it's not. Um, friends, I'm going to have a lot of questions for Peter, but I only want to ask a couple of them because, again, the purpose of the forum is to support your questions and your conversation. Yeah. I'm just going to begin with a couple, but as Peter starts answering, think about what questions you have uh, based on your experience and your interests. First question I want to ask Peter is I just I quickly introduced you with a, with a sketch. Let me ask you to introduce yourself by answering a different question. Looking ahead to 2019, what are you going to be working on the most? What's going to be occupying your time and your thoughts? Uh, the same thing that's been occupying it for, in one way, for the last five years, and in many ways for the last, well, 35 years, and in another way for the last 50 years. <clears throat> I have to tell you, I started being a futurist when I was four years old, so I'm, I mean, look a little older than I, <laughs> than I am. No, that's, that's a joke. So um, the story really begins in college. <clears throat> I was going to be a physicist um, in the 1960s, but I found, well, first of all, I flunked a course called Theoretical Mechanics, 
uh, taught by a Russian guy who could barely speak English, but he could write lots of abstract and obtuse equations on the board, which I didn't learn very well, and realized there was a lot more going on in the street in 1968-69 than mm -hmm. was going on in the physics lab. So I said, this is really interesting stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. So I joined um, the sociology to study social change. Uh, came to find out that, believe it or not, sociologists don't study social change. And if they don't, who does? Hardly anybody. Hmm. In fact, because frankly, it takes too long to get publications. So those of you associated with universities know that you can't study something for four or five years. You don't get your dissertation done. You don't get your tenure. You don't get your pubs. You don't get promoted. And so uh, it's really kind of a, a, an orphan, uh, even though sociology was created by Auguste Comte uh, more than 100 years ago to study both social statics, he called it, and social dynamics. Well, the dynamics have taken a back seat. I was interested in that. I did my master's and PhD research in those topics and went off to teach sociology, uh, came to be recruited to the University of Houston, Clear Lake, where I was, um, where they had already established a futures program. And it took me three or four years to realize I was teaching statistics. And I said, well, wait a minute, a social change, future, sounds like the same thing to me. So I said, even though nobody taught me about the future when I was in school, maybe I can help learn and teach others about it. So I took that program over in, uh, in 1983 and ran it for 30 years, developed the curriculum, put it online, all kinds of wonderful things like that. And finally then, I, gr I, re I graduated, I always say, I retired <laughs> and founded, as you said, Teach the Future, which is taking exactly the same learning at a different level uh, and trying to introduce it to high school students and college students. Uh, we study a lot about the past, as we should, uh, but we should also study about the future, get students prepared, not just for learning about the traditions and the lessons of the past, but preparing for indeed a different future, which as you well know, Brian, more than anybody, is coming at us much faster than before and with much greater complexity and difficulty in terms of uh, challenging us with the wicked problems of. So uh, this is a long-term vision. I hope a hundred years from now, people will look back on our time and say, wait a minute, why didn't you teach them, tell them about the future? Mm -hmm. Well, we have a lot of reasons you can't teach about the future, et cetera, et cetera. But nevertheless, that will be, that's my vision. I'm not going to see that, <laughs> but I do hope it'll come someday. So what I'm doing in the next year is to do exactly that, continuing basically as with you, thank you very much for your service on our board, recruiting people literally from around the world. Uh, now have colleagues in Brazil and the Netherlands, uh, Mexico, uh, lots of other places, uh, India and the UAE, to begin the process of trying to introduce futures thinking to their countries, as I am trying to do here in North America. That's a that's a, a global historical innovation, which is tremendous. Uh, right now, let me ask: um, looking at the post-secondary part of your work, where are you getting the most traction? You know, colleges and universities worldwide, where are you getting the most interest and engagement in futures thinking? Well, it turns out that I just uh, chatted with a woman named Jacqueline who is from Southern New Hampshire University. Uh, I think you know, Brian, that I've <coughs> traveled New England the last few months, and SNHU is on my short list of very, very innovative colleges and universities, and I'm in active conversations with them to bring futures thinking to both the School of Business and to the, uh, to the School of Humanities, Arts and Sciences there at SNHU. So I want to shout out to Jacqueline there and, and look forward to, uh, uh, to working, continuing to working with them. Uh, otherwise, uh, we have one of our board members, you know, Sam Miller, and he runs mm -hmm. the only required foresight course in the country in a college uh, within the business school at Notre Dame University. We helped them set up that course. It's required of all 600 juniors every year. And so and they're very proud of that. Uh, their, their school is ranked uh, number one or two as the best undergraduate business school in the country. And yet, 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 nobody imitates. Nobody imitates. That. Brian, you can tell me this, Brian. Why don't innovation scale in education? 
They oh. scale in business. They scale in entertainment, sports, military, whatever. Educators look down the street and say, yeah, they're doing great things, and they've gotten this award, and they're ranked, and blah, 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 but we, no, we don't have to do that. It's just really tragic. So they've been doing this for 10 years, and I promote their program a great deal. 10 years. Ten years. Oh, that's fantastic. Yes. And nobody has oh. copied it. Well, not yet. Uh, <laughs> let's keep thinking about that. So one, okay. one thing just to put out to everybody here on, uh, on this discussion is uh, just think about it. If you can think of any examples of futures teaching happening uh, around you, wherever you are, at your college, your university, your high school, your museums, your libraries, and where your community. Um, let me let the, me, uh, me interrupt. Say, Brian. Let me tell you though that I've I have I, I basically went through my Rolodex, and I have uh, recruited about sixty or seventy people around the world who are teaching foresight. Most of them are doing it as a as elective, or they're doing it on their own, or they're including it in other classes. Which all power to them. So the Notre Dame is the only one that has a fixed institutional relationship with foresight. But there are many others who are uh, teaching it more or less on their own, and I, I applaud them. They're they're the real pioneers in this effort. Well, we were um, we, we were having an email exchange about the digital literacy phenomenon. Uh, and we found through a lot of research that it's pretty similar. The digital literacy is often practiced by individuals, um, but very rarely by programs and almost never by institutions so far. Um, it's way, way back way before, I, uh, before I was a futurist, I, I created the first computer literacy course at the University mm. of Houston Lake in 1979, before the oh. IBM PC. We were using the Apple II. I mean, the, yeah. the whole generalization and the premise of that course is you don't have to program computers to use them. And, uh, and we taught that course for four or five years until, believe it or not, the computer science faculty told the administration that I shouldn't teach the course because I didn't have a degree in computer science. Is that, you is found that, is that another story about higher education? <laughs> One reason why innovation is down scale. Exactly. Um, well, then let me, let me ask you a, a related question, uh, and then I want to turn to the audience uh, for their thoughts. Um, what have you discovered about the pedagogies of teaching foresight? I mean, are there particular pedagogical approaches that really, really uh, work well to teach foresight? Uh, or are those, are, and the opposite, are there those that we should avoid at all costs? Well, my, of course, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm just getting over a cold. My... Um, mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, my soapbox is, of course, teaching the future. But somebody asked me once, what good is that? Well, as if it wasn't obvious to me and to you and most people, but nevertheless, <laughs> it was a good question. And I was challenged to say, really, what's it for? And I also, mm -hmm. uh, as you do, uh, mm -hmm. put a great mm -hmm. deal of emphasis on, uh, we hope, the shift, if it's happening or certainly it needs to happen, away from so much content in education, essentially what I call teaching from the textbook and learning the facts and teaching skills. Okay, that's a gigantic movement. You know it better than I and all of that. But the futures is ex an excellent platform for doing that because there's no textbook, because teachers and students are forced from the very first day to begin to figure out how to do this, how to understand, anticipate, and influence the future. And without a text, you can't retreat to the facts. There are facts, there are trends, and there are events, and there are stakeholders, and all of that. But in terms of the future, of course, that's yet to be discovered. It's not like the past where we can reach some kind of consensus on this is what happened given the evidence, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a long talk, uh, I uh, which I could launch into, which I don't want to, because I want to jump to questions from your audience. But um, most importantly, we should... Futures is a great way to start teaching skills like critical thinking, creativity, communication, and digital literacy, uh, as well as uh, mm -hmm. giving students some sense that they can not only be prepared for the future, but they can also be empowered and have the confidence to believe that to, in, their, in their little sphere of influence, as we all have, uh, they can actually influence the future. Mm -hmm. So they can have mm -hmm. analysis, analysis as well as agency. As well as agency. We hope so. Definitely. Let me, uh, let me, let me uh, turn to the credits. Uh, friends, we have, um, again, three major ways of uh, sharing your thoughts. Uh, so if you would like to join us up here on stage, uh, it's very, very easy to do so. In fact, let me just uh, 
add a little uh, pod to the screen here. Um, so you should be able to see um, on the right side a kind of teal colored block. And if you click that, it says join podium. That should beam you up here um, by video on stage if your camera is working. Now, if you don't want to use video, that's okay. Uh, click the raised hand button to type in a question uh, or to offer a thought. And again, you can turn to the chat box. We're um, in the chat room where I am. People have been already discussing your 1979 insight, Peter, about uh, not having to use uh, computers, not having to program computers to use them. Uh, so let's see, we have greetings from Tom Riley out in Boston. Hello, Tom. Oh, hang on a second. Uh, can you hear Hi, Tom. Me? Yeah, okay. can you hear us? I'm an alumnus of the University of Houston. Uh, Electrical engineering, 1969. Uh, recently, wow. I've been running an outfit called the Big Moon Dig. Well, what we've evolved into is writing short stories set in the near future that are exactly about what you're talking about. That is looking at elements of the future, specifically um, about uh, global warming, what to do about it, uh, what so students could envision themselves doing stuff. Uh, Wonderful. We got a book uh, due out early in the next year, uh, but it's a unfortunately going to be an expensive technical book. Um, do you know of, of examples of people using literature, particularly the short story, uh, to teach uh, futurist mm. stuff? My, that's a great question, Tom. Thank you very much. My colleague, Joe Tankersley, who is a former board member at the Association of Professional Futurists and now retired from Disney Imagineering, who, where he was an exhibit designer and producer for Epcot and other Disney uh, facilities, uh, wrote a book called Reimagining. I think it's Reimagining Tomorrow. And uh, it is stories about exactly what you're talking about. He set out with a particular mission, and that was to present positive images of the future, which unfortunately are rarer than negative images. We can all think of catastrophic change, and we've got lots of movies and lots of books about that. And he set himself a task, are there any positive images out there? So I would, I would um, uh, encourage you to pick that book up and promote it. Brian, you may want to also put it wherever you put your enormous uh, social media landscape, put that out too. It's it's very interesting book uh, and it's, uh, it, it is the same thing, positive stories about the near-term future. Great uh, question. Actually, Thank you. positive isn't it, uh, precisely what you want is to generate buy-in, that is to get the students uh, invite the students to buy into spending their time tackling these problems. And sure. No, and, and, and it does that. It does that as well. I mean, we have to have hope, and we have to and, be practical and pragmatic. But we also have to be optimistic, even to get out of bed in the morning, if not to influence the future. So uh, I agree with you. Buy-in has to be there. Buy-in is now a, a psychology thing, well understood, and understood well enough to teach. Right. as a Good. specific item and so Terrific. that's our primary thing we also do a bunch of uh uh youtubes supporting this thank you that's wonderful Tom. thank you very thank you, much Tom. good question thank you um again for, you can see how easy this is just to pop up and uh and ask a video um and uh peter as one answer for myself i can just say that uh this past semester teaching my future of education class i talked about 10 science fiction short stories and uh I'll probably share that syllabus at some point because it was a lot of fun to see how that went. Uh, but yeah, we have. Of course, uh, I will. Put it on our group. Of course, that educators be great. Uh, now we have a question here from um, a longtime friend of the uh, of the program. Uh, this is from uh, Tian Hongxi, who asks: Is there some institution in China that is pioneering in this field? Good question. Well, Tian. Um, I'm very sorry to say that I don't have any contacts uh, in China. Uh, the futures field itself, I would have to say, is largely a Western uh, uh, Anglophile uh, institution at the moment. There are futurists in Africa and India and, and, the, and the Asian countries of China and, and, the, and Southeast Asia, though they are rarer 
Uh, and for right now, I do not know. There is supposedly a Chinese Future Society that I've heard about, but unfortunately, mm -hmm. I don't have any contact with them at this moment. So uh, I wish I could point you to someone who could do that. I would encourage you to contact the people at the World Futures Studies Federation, which is a long-term established organization of international futurists. And if anybody with contact in, contacts in China, it would be that membership. I can send you or I can give Brian a contact, if you don't know already, with the secretary general of that organization, very active Iranian futurist, and he would know if there's anybody in, in China that you should contact. Excellent. Great question. And if you do okay. find anybody, tell them, tell them about Teach the Future and put them in touch with me. I'd love to talk with them. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, from the chat box, we have a, a note from uh, Mark Corbett Wilson, awesome friend of the program, who says that he wants to make sure that we know the full title of Joe Tankersley's book is Reimagining Our Tomorrows, Making Sure Your Future Doesn't Suck. I hope that's a <laughs> Thank you. Joe's Thank you. known for his wit. <laughs> uh, and we have a comment from uh, Sherry Jones, um, who says, it seems to be I guess she's referring to your description of teaching the future. It seems to be an argument for informed prediction, thought experiments, counterfactual histories. We do this actively in philosophy because we must consider whether our ideas are sound in a given case study. So not a question, uh, an observation, Jim. Oh, thank you, Sherry. I have to tell you that my undergraduate degree is in philosophy. Uh, ah. and it was an excellent preparation for uh, for future studies because what can we know and how do we know what could we can know and the particular problem uh, in, in epistemology frankly was the the subject that I carried away from that with the most interest throughout the rest of my life I taught courses in scientific thinking and informal logic and informal reasoning and inferential reasoning and the problem is uh, and I wrote a paper on this for the for our world futures review you, I know, we know how to support inferences in what's called the declarative or the indicative tense, which is the tenses of facts, so right. tenses that use will. But how do you support a statement of plausibility or possibility, statements about may, might, and could, which is the language that we use in foresight? And so I wrote a paper to try and, and cut through that. So the epistemology nice. of the future is extraordinarily interesting. Most people say you can't predict the future. They are right, and therefore they go ahead and do it anyway because that's the only thing they know how to do. It's kind of a kind of a conundrum. <laughs> I, I and and again, I, I, I go back to I go back to my own background in education. Where did we learn about the future? We didn't learn in a futures class. We didn't learn in history class, which barely got up to World War II, much less the future. And where we really learned it was in science class where the future is predictable. And so that was the only time we were really asked and need had to in order to get an A. We had to make statements, predictions about the future, use the formulas, come up with the right answer, get my grade, graduate, go to Harvard, whatever, whatever. So we extrapolated from that to everything else. Well, you throw humans into the mix and that whole, that whole predictive possibility gets exploded. But that's why we need to be teaching foresight in schools before students walk out of school with that misimpression that even though you can't predict the future, the only thing we can do with it is to predict it. And there is way more to do than just that. Wow, that's a fantastic observation. A whole, a whole field based in the subjunctive tense. Um, yes. We, we, have, uh, we have a request uh, from Lisa Durf who asks, so will you be writing another book for educators about foresight? The book I read seemed like it was for a business audience. So you're only on your 29 minutes so we're putting you to work, Peter. <laughs> I've written two books uh, with Andy Hines, my colleague who's now running the Houston Graduate Program. He's really the writer in our group. I was the kind of the professor. I'm more of a talker than a writer, but uh, uh, teaching about the, uh, thinking about the future is more of a handbook for, for practitioners. Uh, it's kind of a lot, a bunch of tips, a couple of hundred tips about how to approach the future. And then I took my experience in teaching the future and we wrote the book teaching about the future which is not for teachers but it is the curriculum the university of houston curriculum written out in large uh, we have the same problem that tom has priced as a textbook which as we know is a 
is a pricing racket <laughs> by the publishing industry. So it's not cheap, and 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 yet uh, it still is. That's the best thing that we have. There are two other books uh, that I would promote for students, student-facing books. One is called Our Playbook, the Futures Thinking Playbook, is a workbook for uh, high school, for middle school students. It takes it walks them through the whole process of developing scenarios about the world that they develop in the end, and it's a great little book available on Amazon. The other is a book uh, compiled by two of our colleagues in California called "What the Foresight." Cleverest title I probably in the field. What the foresight? <laughs> and it's more. It is activity. It's not so much a process, but it's a set of excellent activities to help students figure to discuss their own future and the world that they're facing. So it's a little bit more what we call personal futures. The playbook is more about macro futures. And I would encourage mm -hmm. you to look into both of those. Those are both, and those could be used. They have been used in summer camps and extracurricular activities. They could be used as units uh, within middle school. We have another publication coming out soon that was actually produced in the 1990s. It's not available right now. I can send you a copy if you, if you send me an email. It's called, uh, it's called Shaping Our Future, and it was actually a facilitator's guide to a two-day high school workshop. And it comes with a video that describes what the students go through, their comments, comments from teachers, and things like that. So the, the three of those kind of begin to put together uh, what we would call an educational resource library for teachers to start using. Plus, we also have our Teach the Future library library.teachthefuture.org, and that has 60 or 70 different modules of all kinds of different types, different subjects, uh, different levels, and you can paw through that just as a, as a, as a, as a heap of, of stuff. You may find some good things in there as well. So no, no real book for teachers on the horizon at this moment. Sorry. Oh, that's a great question and a really, really rich answer. Um, friends, let me just uh, remind you to... Um, if you can, to escape the confines of the chat box, because um, I'm seeing a whole bunch of great stuff there. Um, uh, but we, if you could uh, share your thoughts either through uh, clicking the raised hand to join us on stage, or you can just click the, uh, the podium, or to type in a question uh, through the uh, question mark uh, button so that uh, we can share this with everybody there. Um, uh, Sherry Jones has a quick question for you. Uh, it's a deep deep answer, I suspect. She asks, are you thinking about the future in terms of ethical consequentialism or teleology? Uh, is that either, I didn't know that was an either or. I don't know what ethical consequentialism is, first of all. If that's utilitarianism, that, that is an ethical position. Um, and, and I know what teleology is, but I don't see those as necessarily opposites. You might be able to help me. You want to get on the, the video or the, or the audio to kind of explain maybe what those things are. It might be a little bit extensive to do as a chat. Uh, yeah, sure. If your video is up, um, you can join us. We'll get a conversation. Otherwise, I can relay your thoughts if you, if you type them in. Um, we have, um, again, that's a, yeah, and she, she's stuck in chat right now, but she'll add a few things. Um, as we can. Um, the uh, Myron Williams observes that in 1982, he took a class at Michigan State on education in the future, and that was his introduction to futures thinking. Who so taught that class, a, Myron? Yeah, let us know, Myron. Uh, so we seem to have Thanks. a whole kind of archaeology. I got, I got my graduate degrees at Michigan State, uh, a little bit before uh, your time, but uh, but uh, same, same place, yeah. Well, I mean, as a uh, Peggy Reithmiller. Uh, not familiar with her, sorry. Oh, it's okay. Uh, again, there's a, whole, there's a whole history, a kind of lineage to this that we have to... Uh, yeah, 1982 about. was kind of the end of the, what I'll call the golden age of future studies, uh, what <laughs> recruited me to social change first and then the future. That's when Clear Lake established its program. Jim Dater established his concentration in future studies at the University of Hawaii during that time. So two academic programs... Two organizations, the World Future Society and the Federation, were both founded. But frankly, in the 1980s, it all kind almost went away, literally. Uh, the World Future Society had its largest meeting in Toronto in 1980. They had 5,000 people. Their last meeting in Chicago was 60 people. 
<laughs> so, and that's that's what? another story about the society. But um, the it, it was kind of towards the end. It was all in the air and the water through the fifth, the sixties and seventies, and it kind right. of went away with uh, kind of the Reagan Revolution, the baby boom, which of course was the energy of so much change during that time. All had to go to work. Uh, they had to put on a suit and. And all except Brian cut their hair and they all kind of went out and uh, got mortgages and families and jobs and kids and all of that. So uh, the, the energy went out. What happened after the 80s, however, was that the Soviet Union collapsed, surprised almost everybody, including the CIA. Yep. Uh, yes. The first Gulf War, the appearance of the World Wide Web, the tech boom and then the tech bust and then the Y2K, which was its own bust, et cetera, and say, go on and on from there. And people started looking around, or at least awake, were saying, wait a minute, this future stuff is a little harder than it looks. It's not just trend extrapolation. It's not just kind of hanging on to what there is. So the, the field since that time has grown. The Association of Professional Futurists now has about 500 plus members and growing slowly but but substantively and, and sustainably so i think we're i think we've made it as a somewhat small respectable profession because the pace of change is increasing so rapidly but yeah 1982 was kind of the tail end of the golden age well, that's fascinating to think about um if i could let me ask about one uh future is thinking effort that comes um out of uh, a personal background for me uh, when I was a teenager, I was introduced to the Future Problem Solving Group. And uh, they gave us a couple of questions. And they blew my mind. They, uh, we ended up producing, I think I was 15 years old, and I ended up producing a scenario about hydropower underneath the uh, Great Lakes leading to the creation of a new economic and political entity caught between Canada and the United States. Um, that you know, the fresh water would be something of enormous power in the future. I was wrong politically, but right in terms of resources, which isn't bad for a 15 year old. Um, future of problem solving is still around. Uh, what, still around. Do, what, role they, what role do they play? Are they just an independent they're, they're actor? They're an extracurricular, extracurricular activity that's conducted usually outside of class after school. Yeah, I, I, it's kind of like debate, though it's not debate, mm -hmm. it's a club and students will join it and they will learn what is called uh, 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 creative problem solving, which some of you may know as the, as the heritage and the legacy of Paul Torrance, who began at uh, SUNY Buffalo and then basically made his name at the University of Georgia. And so creative problem solving is a, is a set of steps and future problem solving basically begins not with a current problem, but with a potential future problem. So if it was the, the same as when you were a teenager, Brian, what happens today is it's few, students are given a future scene. They are given mm -hmm. the one that I saw at their international competition was a, a city that went very into smart cities and smart governance mm -hmm. and smart mm -hmm. governance. And yet they started to get hacked. And they started to really experience, you know, huge integrity problems for their whole governance system, not just for, you know, a little bit of bookkeeping, but how are they going to govern the city now? So students at that point then launch into the creative problem solving, which is to identify the problem, come up with alternative solutions, criteria, select criteria, blah, 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 and write the solution and the scenario about how to address that problem. And they are graded then on the quality of their problem solving, the quality of their quote solution. Uh, it's uh, every state, I think in the union has a chapter of future problem solving. They do coaching and learning every summer for teachers. And there, when I was with them six or seven years ago, there were half a dozen countries that were beginning to participate. I'm sure that's mm -hmm. larger than it is now. So it is a great, great movement to introduce futures to students. We really appreciate all the work that they do. Well, they also I'm have a separate the section. They also have a separate section that is not as well known and perhaps not something. It's just a straight scenario creation section. So it's a creative writing competition. And I heard some of the scenarios students came up with, and this is more of a, a, a writing exercise than a problem solving exercise, but they were brilliant. They were really, really good for high school students. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. Future problem solving, a good plan to look into. Yes. Uh, well, we have um, Chris Meyer, who is joining us on stage, but his camera isn't working right now. Um, Chris, does your audio work at least? No. Uh, Chris, let me, uh, why don't you uh, 
ping me um, on chat. In fact, I'll reach out to you while uh, um, and try and find you and ask you a question about that. Um, let me ask a different question. Um, on the higher education side, um, where are you seeing the most exciting scholarly work being done in future studies now? Uh, you know, what departments, what movements, uh, what fields do you see are producing that? Uh, I, I forgot to mention before that there's actually the very first undergraduate degree in future studies, which appeared at ASU. Uh, I, I am so I, I confess that I only learned about it after two years. I've been, it's in its third year right now. It's called it's an undergraduate and a graduate degree in the future of innovation in society. SFIS.org. Nice. So that's not research, but that's you know I'm more of, I'm more in, in the teaching field. One of the big problems of research in foresight that has bedeviled us throughout the whole field is that there is no organized doctoral program in future studies anywhere in the world. Uh, that's, a, that, that's a real sad state. It's really a shame because, as you know, this is where the really heavy-duty research is done in doctoral programs. Uh, the, the faculty of a doctoral program spend almost all of their time in research as opposed to teaching, mm -hmm. practicing. Mm -hmm. And secondly, uh, they have graduate students who are paid to actually do a lot of the work, uh, if not all of the work, for, uh, for the doctoral uh, professors. So without that kind of facility, uh, we do not have, I believe, a sufficiently large stream of research. We have academic journals. They're peer-reviewed. They're doing as well as they can, but almost all of them are articles written by by, by academic futurists like myself, more teachers than researchers, and by practitioners. So there's a, there's a lot of evidence in the field that people are sharing what they do. But in terms of the fundamental research and foresight, we are, I have to admit, we are lacking. We do not have the, uh, the facilities or the people to be able to, um, uh, to do the kind of research you're talking about, Brian. Well, this is a, that's, a, that's a sore point and uh, one that we should return to. Um, Very much. Let me uh, let me introduce you to uh, Tom Haynes, who uh, is coming at you actually from Houston. Hey, Tom. Hello. How you doing? I got out just in time. <laughs> what before Harvey? <laughs> yeah. No. No. Actually, no. We were there for Harvey too. In fact, Harvey oh. was within a block and a half of our house. Oh yeah, we were. We're out. We were I'm actually out with Katie, so we we uh, we got okay. close on a few times, but uh, did fortunately absolutely. I wasn't in the part of Katie that flooded completely. Yeah, um, so what's on your mind? Yeah, uh, so I had a question in terms of the Teach for the Future and and just how you're approaching these. We've been talking about futuring as a separate program and entity, um, but one thing that I'm always trying to do is to figure out how to fold futuring into existing courses. Um, exactly. I teach government, and uh, uh, but I'm also a, a technologist and futurist, et cetera, on the side. And so I'm always throwing elements of that in. But to have a more organized curriculum that would help me with empowered learning and uh, that sort of approach, because this is, this is what I'm being developing a lot of stuff around. Uh, but I'm just wondering what, what exists, and um, do you have any suggestions? Is that... Um, Something teach for the future uh, is is uh, specifically geared toward, or is it more standalone workshops? Well, it is. It is both. Uh, there are these two major approaches. I think I, I have a slide that that kind of riffs on where you could teach the future in almost any academic discipline. Fortunately, I don't have government in there, but in math and in science and in history and whatever, I do believe teachers should be focusing or, or mentioning and working with the future with their students and all of those. So, But in order to do that well, the students probably need some specific preparation. It doesn't need to be a whole course, but maybe a unit that kind of goes through the basic approach, what the terms are how to you know, disabuse them of some of the misimpressions they've gotten perhaps from other, other academic and, and other learning and, and that. So I think it's both. I think we should have a course that introduces students to the future, but then it should permeate every topic. I mean, there's a future to science. There's a future mm -hmm. to government. There's a future. There's even a future to history and history as one of the more interesting things, and I, I, I've only seen it once, is that the people in history, we're their future. 
what did they think mm-hmm. their future was going to be and how mm-hmm. is it the same and how is it different and I, I heard a wonderful comment from a very well-known writer now she's a historian staff writer with the, the new yorker called jill lapore and just in an offhand comment during a podcast she said of course the job of the historian is to resurrect or to 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 protect the uncertainty of the past that the people we we again with teaching mm-hmm. science it's all predictable or at least tries to be in history it's all determined i mean it's the whole story right. i mean a, B, C, beginning middle end and we forget that the people that we're talking about didn't know the end and they were working right. it out day by day very uncertain right. in all of their and so unfortunately in order to make it a story we pretty well leave all of that complexity out the counterfactual histories, the alternative histories. So if you're right. teaching in all social studies, bringing that in is a great way of, and, and gee, we're just like them. They're just like us. They didn't know what they were doing either, even though it may have been right. successful, awful. They were working it out essentially day by day, just like we are. So it really is both of those things. I, in, in fact, I have to tell you, this is, a, this is an amazing coincidence. One of my colleagues who graduated from the Houston program way back in the late 80s, was a teacher at, uh, at Katie High School, uh, Kaylin <laughs> Harris. She ended up being a principal at uh, Cinco Ranch High School, assistant okay. principal. She's now retired in Tyler, but she comes back to Katie a lot because she has a new grandbaby there. <laughs> so uh, if you send me your contact information, I will put you in touch. We, we've worked together. She's really a great – and she taught government in, uh, at Katie High School. So uh, she's, uh, wow. she's she's your she's your go-to person right there. See, well, this is all about networking. It's we're a very small group, and we can put people together. <laughs> yeah, no, I I, I, I actually teach for uh, Houston Community College. We actually met about I don't know seven eight years ago. You spoke for uh, a group from the Chancellor's office, the old Chancellor. Oh, who's absolutely, since yeah, that, that was yeah. in a in the paper I yeah. wrote called "The Three Horizons of Higher Education." Yeah, thank you yes, very much. Uh, we, yeah, that was a great talk and uh, gave right. me a lot to chew on. Um, but I right. teach at Houston Community College and I teach at the new West Houston Institute. And I know they've been talking to some of the people over at U of H. So hopefully we can get some partnerships going there because the Institute is all about reinventing and futuring everything, design thinking and building this stuff as opposed to just regurgitating and dread, you know, dredging up the old stuff over and over again like we've traditionally done and to break down some of the yeah. things that I think um, the, the some of the things the not invented here problem uh, generates. Oh, yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but, yeah. The political. You know. So I'm going to be in Houston in a few weeks teaching at our uh, week long certificate program at, at UH. So maybe we should chat about that too. Oh sure, sure. Yeah. Oh, happy to hook up okay. at any point. Um, let me know yeah. and I'll introduce you to Kaylin. You'll you'll get a lot. You get a lot from that relationship. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Thanks, Brian. Absolutely. Well, thank you for Thanks, coming, Tom. I'm glad to connect you, too. Um, we have uh, uh, some interesting discussion going on in the chat about uh, what it means to do history with, uh, with an eye on the future and uncertainty. Uh, let me ask uh, another question, if I could, um, which is, um, well, and again, friends, uh, I, have, I have many, many questions, um, so please uh, just um, don't let me take over the show. Um, bring up uh, your questions, especially as we have about nine minutes left to go. Um, in the 21st century, uh, we have many more technologies and platforms for communication uh, than before. Uh, and so I'm fascinated by the emergence of uh, certain types of futurists. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, of uh, Yuval Harari. I'm thinking of Michio Kaku. Uh, and one of the ways they become popular is through uh, YouTube and through other forms of social media. Um, where do you see some of the intersections of technology and teaching the future? Uh, I mean, is there, when you talk to high school students, when you talk to teachers, when you talk to university students, how can we best deploy technology to help students learn with the future? Well, clearly, uh, we should make more uh, more effort to post things. I'm unfortunately too old for social media. I've tried a number of times and totally failed. Uh, and we should produce uh, decent videos. Uh, and, in fact, I'm talking to a woman who has a, video platform in Canada where we can take our content and put that out uh, for, you know, for mainly for teachers. I mean, it's very hard, as we know today, expensive and difficult to get around the world. And uh, so 
this is a it's always been a dream of mine. We published the the playbook and and some of these other books, but uh, we need to become more visual and more video oriented. And I'm looking for people who would love to to help us do that. I'm afraid I don't have the the skills of that. I produced a, a video for a fundraising campaign, Brian, as you know, we did a long time ago to build the library, uh, and that was fine, but also really expensive. And so I'm trying to figure out how to do this when a, with a person who doesn't doesn't really have those kind of skills. So open to it. I put, I took I was the, uh, the the foresight degree at the University of Houston was the first fully online degree at the University of Houston, which I moved from uh, face to face delivery and beginning in 2001 and completed that in 2005 or 2006. And today. Uh, that program entertains probably 80% of the students are, are remote, are, are taking the degree, a high degree of interaction. It's not rip and read kind of stuff. It's, it's a high degree of interaction because foresight is a complex skill and you can't learn it out of a book or you can't learn it in a series of, of like algebra kind of uh, con type exercises. But uh, it's, a, it's a great program. It's graduating some great futurists. So I'm very much open to that. I just don't have, haven't had the window to be able to produce it just yet. And, and you and I are having a discussion about using social media in teaching the future and in classes. I would love to, uh, you sent me some links, which I haven't looked at yet, but uh, I would love to be able to put that into the library as well. As here's how you can use social media to teach about the future. I think we should. Uh, I think there's a big role for computer gaming as part of that. Um, Absolutely. Especially in terms of simulation. Um, we, we have a, a, we had a question. We had an engagement with uh, uh, California State East Bay a couple of years ago in which mm -hmm. Katie King teamed up with a game designer in the Bay Area, and they had a 10-day uh, summer workshop for students, uh, half of which was to develop the scenarios. Katie also wrote the playbook, so she had that process down. And then this guy took over, and they turned the scenarios into, into computer games. Um, and so nice. we also have a colleague... We have a colleague at Carnegie Mellon who was an unbelievable, outstanding futurist, a guy named Stuart Candy. Brian, I'm sure you know about him. He is, he is the first of what's called an experiential futurist. He's very big on putting the future into the real world and giving people gaming, obviously, one. He is now offering the game designers at Carnegie Mellon, which has a tremendous uh, uh, position in that in that field scenarios to be able to write in games about the future. So we hope to see some things uh, coming out of that in the next year or two. Right, makes all kinds of sense. Uh, in the in text, Sherry Jones adds that um, there is uh, many digital games present counterfactual histories. I suppose that those who use the game-based living material are also doing some works in futurism. Uh, so that goes that goes along with this. We, uh, we also have a question uh, from Phil Katz, uh, again, a longtime uh, friend of the program, um, and with a history background himself, who asks, does foresight as a field of study and teaching uh, face particular challenges at a time like ours when intellectual authority is under all sorts of assault? Um, I believe it, 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 you're right. I, um, there is a gigantic, a very strong uh, pushback by a number of people in society, as you know, Phil, that uh, does has begun to distrust. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't begin to distrust. I think trust in in authorities is a is a is a pendulum. It's a cycle. It swings back and forth. Uh, my own era of the Vietnam War, there was a huge distrust, as there well should have been, sure. in governments uh, spinning and, and lying to the to the general public. And this has come and gone over time. So we're in one of those phases where there's a lot of that. Uh, actually, I've taught uh, foresight in a number of countries where there has not been even the uh, the idea of a free speech idea of uh, some kind of democratic discussion. And I leave those countries wondering, uh, they're not going to do any of this because we're trying to teach their students critical thinking and the thinking on their own. Well, that's not uh, generally, it's, it's, it, there are people in our country that don't want us to think on our own, but there are people in other countries that where that in fact is the official policy. So it is a, it is a uh, what shall I say, a subversive activity. But at the same time, I believe that the fact that we are still 
a democracy, I believe. Thank you very much for the you know 2018 election. That that the that future studies is a way of giving students the ability to think on their own and basically to put uh, to, to to put to a test what the authorities are saying and and people who are looking for authoritarian and this is this goes right back to my own problem with education in general education in general is about answers math science history it's about getting the right answer and getting an a and graduating and going to harvard i mean that's what it's about so you get out in the world and they're looking for people whether they're bosses or whether they're they're, they're politicians uh, they're looking for people who are certain about how the answer should be and I think we should be teaching students to not be certain, to embrace mm. uncertainty as a value, mm. not just as, a, as an inconvenience, but to say we are free when we are uncertain. I have to tell you, my daughter taught, a, or she started teaching in, in middle school, seventh grade, uh, English and language arts. And we were talking about this and she texted me one time. She said, a, a girl began her answer to my question in class the other day with, quote, it depends. I love that. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. the of an education that doesn't allow authoritarians that are accepted and embraced by many, many people, 35 to 45 percent of our population, uh, that begins to teach them to have the confidence to think on their own and not simply accept the pat answers from any authorities that you have. So uh, thank you, Phil. It, it, it's a, extremely important. In fact, in these days, it's more important than ever, even because we are getting uh, so much a strain of authoritarianism, even in our own country. Great answer. Thank you so much. And, and Phil, what a great probe of a question. Uh, friends, we are almost out of time, so we have time for one last question. And I have to read this one out loud because uh, this is from someone who uh, can't get the video to come in. Um, I'll read this verbatim. Uh, do you have any suggestions? This is from uh, Chris Mayer. Do you have any suggestions on how to improve senior leaders' ability to think about the future related to thinking about the future of the organization and its environment? Many are so engaged in the moment that they do not have the time, may lack the ability to think rigorously about the future. The analogy I use uh, uh, is, is, uh, is saving for the future. Uh, we're all responsible adults, let's assume. We all take a portion of what we earn and put it away for a new house, for the kids' education, for retirement. And we would be, most of us consider us to be foolish for, to not to do that. But we spend every single moment serving the interests of the present. And we don't spend any time at all protecting time, just like we protect money, to make an investment in the future. Time is a resource, just like money is. And we should be saving a little bit that time and, and leaders and authorities and organizations should be doing it themselves. In fact, the, the higher they are in the, the hierarchy, the more time they should be protecting, maybe half of their time in strategic issues. One of the problems with our management structure in our country is that students are not given, are not taught to make decisions not taught to think independently, not taught to take responsibility. So when they get into positions of decision-making, they basically kick it up to the boss. And the boss isn't taught that way either. So they kick it up to their boss and their boss and their boss. So executives have absolutely no time to be doing anything excepting making operational decisions. So I would try and point that out to them respectfully and say you should protect the time that you are spending because your view of the future, your influence on the future of the organization is more than any other single person, more than any other group. And if they are looking to you to watch out, be the lookout literally, and to be this to steer the ship, steer the organization toward a better future. And if all you're doing is making operational decisions day in and day out, and you're not investing any of that time, it's very much the same as spending your paycheck, paycheck to paycheck. And some people, unfortunately, as we know, have to do that. But those in responsible positions do save money, and we should save time and invest that time to get a return on an investment, to get it, to say now in 10 years, we are going to be that much better off because we saved that time. Uh, that's an argument that's hard to make, I agree, but it's one that we need to make over and over and over. Now, let me tell you, by the time people in those positions, it's probably almost too late. It's kind of like learning a new language. Again, that's why we should get to early 
in high school and undergraduates in college and give them a sense of the future that is sophisticated, systematic, effective, and that it's not just the misimpressions of how, they, how we dealt with the future in the past. Because dealing with the future in the past was fine for the past, but it's certainly not fine for the world we're in today. So uh, that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here preaching to the choir, I understand. So we'll all, we'll all join in the hymn here. <laughs> Right from the same page, but we also have to take this out to the other people who are not here today. Thank you for the, thanks for the question. Well, indeed, thank you so much, Chris, for a fantastic question, and Peter, thank you for such an epic answer. Um, I love how you 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 bring this uh, hour to a close by talking about time, um, both uh, Chris, in help. our operation. <laughs> well, that's that's the way this works. Uh, this Great. is a, a a community effort and a, a networked effort. Um, we have to wrap up, but let me, let me just thank you again, Peter, um, for taking the time uh, to invest with us for this hour. Um, what are the best ways to reach you and to catch up with you? Uh, we have a website, which is teachthefuture.org. Easy enough to remember. Uh, Peter at teachthefuture.org is my, is my email address. Those are the best things. We also have on that website... Great get in touch box and they can you can send me messages if you don't want to use the email and we get all those and we respond to all of those so by all means check out the website check out the library.teachthefuture.org look up uh, uh, and I have tons and tons of materials so uh, I don't like to weigh people down until they ask um, and yet uh, when you ask more than you bargained for I can guarantee and Brian it's been an absolute pleasure to interact with you and with your audience. You do a great work in promoting the future within education and technology, and we're real partners in this. I, and, and as I told a group the other day, uh, we're missionaries. This is, this is a mission uh, that we are trying to bring futures thinking both to adults, but even now, even more importantly, to young people, and that's, that's my mission today. So thanks for the opportunity to share that with your group. Thank you for sharing that mission. That's a very futures-oriented mission. Uh, but friends, yes. don't 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 go away yet, um, Peter. I'm going to follow up and hopefully catch up with you, uh, bring you back next year, so we can hear more how this has gone. Um, before we all go, let me uh, just quickly share with you uh, some information about where we're going over the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, <clears throat> Futures thinking is a subversive activity for destabilizing the future. This is a fantastic event. Thank you, friends, uh, for your questions today. And next week, we actually do not have a forum session. Next week, we're taking off because of the holiday. Uh, I may be frozen, um, but we will uh, resume in January. Um, so we have a whole program lined up for actually right through March and into April. Uh, well, let me just talk about the next two. On January 3rd, we have Arya Chernik, who's going to be talking about a wonderful open source pedagogical project. It's a really, really unusual effort at Duke. Uh, it's a brilliant project, and I'm really looking forward to it. Week after that, we have Peter Felton from Elon University, uh, who specializes in, among other things, engaging the students as co-creators of meaning in the classroom. Um, so we're going to be talking about what happens when we take students seriously as producers and as makers in the class. So those are the next two sessions coming up in January. Now, uh, meanwhile, um, if you haven't had a chance to dive in yet, our book club is wrapping up our reading of Zainab Tufetchki's Twitter and Tear Gas, uh, a fantastic book. We are on th Our last week is next week, which is appropriate because we can reference the uh, Yellow Jackets revolt in uh, France. Uh, so you can just go to the blog to catch up on that. If you'd like to grab a copy of that, uh, if you'd like to grab a copy of any book about the future of education, especially with the holidays, if you're looking for great gifts, go to our bookstore. Go to brianalexander.org slash bookstore to find wonderful selected books. And if you'd like to keep talking about this through social media as we run out 2018, you can see you can find us all over the place. Uh, I'm Brian Alexander at Twitter. Use the hashtag FTTE. We have a whole bunch of different contact points. Please join us. In the meantime, stay in touch, keep thinking about the future, and thank you for everything. We'll see you online, and then we'll see you in 2019. Bye-bye.